Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark, and in this episode, I'm joined by co-host, Phil Lindsay. From the world of professional wrestling comes one of the most popular factions of all time, with a rotating roster of stars following a formula built and perfected years ago on another continent, delivering a swagger and style all their own in truly dominant fashion. We're talking about the Bullet Club. The Bullet Club was formed in New Japan Pro Wrestling in 2013 by Prince Devitt, Tama Tonga, Carl Anderson, and Bad Luck Fale. The faction's formation came as the result of Devitt's heel turn on tag team partner Ryusuke Taguchi. The Bullet Club incorporated many elements from the NWO in America, which was featured in World Championship Wrestling. The Bullet Club used the Too Sweet catchphrase, as well as the Wolfpack hand signals, which also came to be known as the Too Sweet. The Bullet Club also used the NWO t-shirt initiation when recruiting new members. Most of those new members came either with surprising heel turns or in-ring announcements by the group. As the faction's numbers began to grow, so too did its influence in New Japan. The Bullet Club became the most villainous group in the company and eventually became the most popular as well. The Bullet Club was inserted into many different angles and storylines running throughout the promotion. Bullet Club leadership changed over the years, beginning with Devitt's departure for WWE where he became Finn Balor. Devitt was replaced by AJ Styles, who was later replaced by Kenny Omega, before the group then fell into the hands of Switchblade Jay White. It was under Omega's leadership that saw the formation of the Elite, the subgroup that consisted of Kenny, the Young Bucks, Cody Rhodes, and Hangman Adam Page. That group was later kicked out of the Bullet Club, and the two sides went to war, with the Elite ultimately leaving to form All Elite Wrestling. The Bullet Club began to expand into other companies, most notably Ring of Honor. The Bullet Club also began enjoying mainstream attention when Styles, Anderson, and Luke Gallows formed the club in WWE. The trio used the two sweet, and the same was true of Balor as well. Indeed, the group's influence was being felt and exploited for audiences all over the world. While the faction's reach continued to grow and the roster kept changing, original founders Tama Tonga and Bad Luck Fale remained with the group. The Bullet Club continues to call New Japan Pro Wrestling home, though recent events suggest that the group may be on its way back to the United States. The Bullet Club took the NWO concepts and built a brotherhood of pro wrestlers along the way. The group remains the most popular and influential faction in the industry, and their continued dominance solidifies their place at the top of the pro wrestling business. And that's the lowdown on the Bullet Club. So they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And I guess I get that, especially in the pro wrestling business. We have seen gimmicks repeated over the years. Sometimes it's a blatant ripoff. Other times it's it's a humble tribute. It all depends on who and what we're talking about, what era we're talking about. The territory era, uh, the Monday Night Wars era, ruthless aggression. Name the, Name your favorite era of wrestling and we can... Talk all day long about how one guy resembles another guy, one female wrestler resembles another female wrestler, whether it's style or taste or gear or finishing move, maybe just a promo, maybe just a t-shirt, maybe just a hairstyle. And it is the nature of the beast that you find repetition in the industry. It's going to happen. It's been said numerous times before. There's no such thing as an original ID anymore. There was basically a handful of great ideas that have just been regurgitated over the years. And sometimes it gets a fresh coat of paint, new set of tires, it comes back, and man, it, it looks brand new again. And then that guy or gal becomes the hottest thing on the planet. So maybe that's what we're talking about with the Bullet Club. However, unlike stables like Evolution, which was a complete tribute to the Four Horsemen, the Shield, which was an extension of the Nexus, just trimmed down and had a lot more impact in the long run, obviously. The Bullet Club seems to have some crazy good longevity. As we record this, the faction has been together eight years this year in one form or fashion, which is pretty impressive. And 
we kicked this thing off by talking about imitation. Right off the jump, Phil, we have to mention the NWO. We have to mention the Wolfpack. We have to mention Too Sweet. I mean, without all of these things, there more than likely is not a Bullet Club. So I, we start a lot of shows with me asking you, so when did so-and-so get on your radar? When did you first notice? And I hate to do that again, but I'm going to do it because <laughs> it makes sense to ask the question. Are you like a recent Bullet Club kind of guy? Or did you know in 2013, hey, man, Fertile Devitt's doing something kind of cool in Japan. When did it start creating a real buzz for you? Uh, so uh, I am, what, like the second iteration of Bullet Club. That's when I jumped on board. And that's when AJ was at the forefront. And he had the title and he was doing the matches with Okada. And I think that's still like my favorite version of Bullet Club because they're just so unlikable. Like they're at like their most heelish. I mean, I that's when I think Bullet Club, that's the era of Bullet Club I think of. That's fair enough. It's funny because when he jumped from Impact, I can't say it without laughing. When he jumped from Impact to go to Japan, he started turning heel in Impact and uh, he was growing his hair out. And it, the, the jokes at the time were, oh, AJ's going emo. Okay. And his hair was getting in his eyes. And it's just, well, if you want to turn heel, first thing you do is grow your hair out, grow a beard, act like you don't care about nobody. It's like, what's next? He's going to start painting his fingernails black. What's going to happen here? He's going to listen to The Cure or Nine Inch Nails or something, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, that's, I was making the jokes and I love AJ, but it, I don't know, in Impact, it felt hey, AJ, look, he's a bad guy now. And all due respect to AJ, I love the guy. But it, it kind of felt forced to me just a little bit. like, cause I guess because he was just such the perennial baby face. It was like imagining Ricky Steamboat turning heels. Like, what? He can't pull this off. He's a baby face. Which, you know, AJ had moments of being heel regardless, but not the full-blown run that they were sort of shoving on you in impact. So... But dude, when he gets to Japan and throws Devitt out and he becomes the leader, as you said, suddenly it worked that that at that look, that attitude, the cockiness. I mean, I'm with you. I I, I can't say that I watched uh Prince Devitt, now known as Finn Balor, of course. I can't say that I watched Prince Devitt's Bullet Club from day one. I was aware. And I was hearing things, but that's all I knew. I didn't have, uh, you know, New Japan streaming service at the time. I don't even know if it was a thing in 2013, if I'm being honest. I didn't get yeah. that till you know, years later. But yeah, for me, the, the AJ, AJ Styles iteration was the one. What made that group so special, do you think? I... I, I think it was that AJ is just so he's he stands out like a sore thumb in Japan already because he's got like the he's got like the southern accent and he's like about as white as you can get and <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's like like man, don't get me wrong, AJ has like a certain swag to him, but he is like yeah. he's like as white as you can get. Yes. And so like he I mean, when you're talking about like a gaijin group and, you know, I guess for listeners that don't know what Gaijin is, like a foreigner group in Japan, and they're doing all of the stuff in America that's like Western heel tactics. And it worked because he was the face of it. And then you've got um, Carl Anderson doing the mouthpiece for it. And he's so obnoxious and he's so um, just over the top in, in, in his role. And then you've got uh, Gallows next to him. It, it's just like they're all just so over the top and so just like annoying that it works and it just works because if they're just obnoxious um it's one thing but they're also cool too because aj has like this cool factor to him he comes out and like when he first came out and he had like the leather jacket and the hoodie and i don't know it's certain things about it that feels like it shouldn't work but us as wrestling fans it's like no this is cool <laughs> AJ's got the classic throwback 1980s pro wrestling voice. And so when I think of Southern based territories, yes. the, the, the go-to catchphrase is let me tell you in something. And it's AJ's got the, what I like to refer to as let me tell you in something. 
Because that's what he that like you're right, that's how he sounds, and it's all good, but yeah, you're right. He he sticks out. You mentioned Anderson, and we gotta talk about Machine Gun because Machine Gun Carl Anderson is the let me get my numbers right. So Devitt was the first, Badlock Fale was the second, Tomatonga was the third, and Anderson was the fourth. I think, I think Anderson and Fale or um, Anderson and Tama joined on the same night, I believe. Right. Those are the original four. So at first, yes. it was, before Bullet Club was officially Bullet Club, it was just um, Devitt and Fale. And then when those two joined, then it officially became Bullet Club. Yeah. And Anderson's got a different style. He is. He's more of a comedian, I think, than anything else. And uh, then, of course, later they bring in Gallows. And, dude, at this point, if you're a pro wrestling fan, the words, the names Gallows and Anderson should be like Lennon and McCartney. Those two names just go together. Like, you can't help it. I mean, it's Gallows and Anderson. And, yeah. uh, man, that you talk about a tag team made for each other, right? Man, I to me, Anderson doesn't get the credit when people talk about Bullet Club enough. Because yes. I felt like he was the backbone of Bullet Club for a long time. And if you are looking at all of the guys that have been the, like, quote-unquote leaders of Bullet Club, like, you can make a strong case that Anderson was kind of, like, the de facto leader. He wasn't actually leader, but he was, like, the mouthpiece for a long time. And mm. I, like, nobody... Well, I won't say anybody. There's actually of course more people but he's definitely one of those guys that benefited the most from bullet club because it just put him on the map it i mean it made him it meant to him and, and gallows as well because gallows was you know coming off wwe and the festus nonsense and um uh and, i mean he did the straight edge thing and that kind of turned him around but he, gallows with anderson is a different beast than anything else he's done with wwe and so those two together, like when people are like, they're one of the greatest tag teams in the world, they are. Cause I mean, just you talk about guys that complement each other well and then they wrestle well. They're just, they're great. And funny. Yes. Yes. <laughs> they don't get enough credit for that either. What about, I'll say, so I'm going to fast forward. I was going to say a little bit, a whole lot. The talking shop of mania stuff. I, I have not watched <laughs> either show. And I've been told, Tom, don't watch the shows. It's not good. But I'm like, I love Anderson Gallows, man. I don't know. Have you have you checked out any of that stuff? I haven't, but I know of people that have worked with them on it. Oh. And so I keep saying I want to check it out. But just all the talking mania stuff and just what they brought to WWE when they signed and even after they left, um, it just speaks to what Bullet Club did for everybody that came over from America. I mean, well, yeah, they came over from America and then came back. And it's like you, they went to Japan and then they kind of made a name for themselves. And then you're kind of seeing now that Gallows and Anderson are making a brand for themselves as well. Absolutely. And it's kind of similar. If I had to make a sort of an odd comparison, I'll say maybe the new age outlaws within DX right? So like DX is this faction and they're a brotherhood and they're crazy and they don't play by the rules and they're rebels. But then you got the new age outlaws, which is, well, here's the tag team of the group, which, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, it's, it's way too early for me to ask the question about NWO versus bullet club, because we've, uh, I'm sure you and I both have, have read and perhaps written columns about comparisons and, you know, uh, how does one measure up to another? I mean, Bullet Club has the longevity, obviously. Even though an NWO felt like it lasted 25 years uh, in the span of five, because, wow, they way ever did it. Um, <laughs> they did, man. It was, in the beginning, yeah. it was great. But in the end, it was, oh, hot garbage. I'm sorry. Yeah, it it, it got bad really fast. So... It, but but the, the, the Japanese part of this, in my opinion, anyway, uh, is what keeps the Bullet Club from going that route. Yes, they've had superstars. Yes, they've had the foreigners come over. Yes, they've Jay White, who's not even American, uh, be the leader. They've had other nationalities, uh, other, uh, other uh, backgrounds, diver diverse backgrounds. And there's even an offshoot, offshoot of uh, 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 
there was an offshoot of Bullet Club and Ring of Honor at one time. Right. And it's it's you know yes they they've had their hands in everything, but at its core it's a Japanese faction, because if this were an American based faction, this thing probably would have been over by now, like done. You think? Yeah, and I think, you know, if you want to throw some of the NWO comparison on it, a part of why NWO um, imploded is, you know, they were doing so much of the backstage politicking too, and that, you know, it it ran amok at at one point. Yeah, Hogan doing what he wanted, and he had crazy stuff like Finger of the the Doom, and and so, and and, um, Bullet Club has never gotten that big for its britches like they've had title reigns but they've always been put in a place where they're the heels and they always eventually get their come up in even if they get a moment where they have a lot of gold or they are like seemingly in control of everything they eventually get their come up in and i think that's part of why they've lasted so long and then the other part is they've managed to be this revolving door like you can take guys out and then you can put somebody else in in the group and it still works and it still is the same dynamic. Yeah. The core is still there. Like, like, all right. So, so it's a band. Okay. And, and the band is the important part. You can change the band members, but the whole point of the band is the band. And for lack of a better reference, I'm going to kiss for me. Kiss is the original, you know, it's, it's Gene, Paul, Ace and Peter. For me, that's the original kiss. Now, one by one, the members have changed. It's always been Paul and Gene. The other two guys have switched out, rotated out, that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, it was still Kiss. That's how they presented themselves. That's what they wore. That's what they called themselves. So Bullet Club, to me, is kind of the same thing. As you said, you can you can switch out members, but the core of it is, hey, we're the Bullet Club, too sweet. We do what we want. And one of the big ideas behind the club is no one's in charge. We don't have a leader. This is... Yeah. Yes, we're a brotherhood, but at the end of the day, it's every man for himself. But if you watch my back, I'll watch yours. But don't try to tell me what to do and don't t- try to take over because that'll be the end. And right. it's funny because like every everyone that's led the club to this point has been destroyed, you know, not so subtle fashion and reminded. Yeah. Remember when we told you when you joined that there's no leader? Well, you kind of didn't listen. So now we're going to put the boots to you and destroy you in the middle of the ring. And there's your going away present. Enjoy life in WWE, you know, which is what they did to AJ when they eventually kicked him out. I mean, the problem is, man, you couldn't keep a secret forever that he and Nakamura both. I mean, the rumors were flying like mad that they were both coming to WWE. They both had signed. So when the, when the time came for the end, of course, they're going to, you know, if it, it's the old idea of, okay, I'm leaving a territory and I'm going to go to another territory and, and the town, you know, or another state, the neighboring state or whatever, but I'm going to go out on my shield. My last match, I'm going to put the company over because it's the right thing to do, which to me feels like, hey, I'm doing the honors, which is what AJ did. Fergal Deva did it. I mean, I'm old school, dude. To me, that's the way to go for sure. Right. And, and yeah, and I think that's a big part of why Bullet Club has lasted, too, because everybody has understood when leaving out, like, nope, I have to leave this in a good place. I got to put it in a better place than I left it. And it's kind of like um, I know there was a, a re- revolving thing with um, the Daredevil comics for a long time where somebody would come in and write Daredevil and it would be good. And it's like, OK, how can I mess up his life enough at the end where I give somebody else that's coming on next something interesting to write? And it it became like a theme with every Daredevil writer. And I feel like it's kind of like that with um, Bullet Club. Like everybody that's leader on their way out, they're like, okay, how can I get out of this and put the next guy up in a good position? And man, did it work because Matt Murdock's life is all kinds of screwed up most of the time. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, it's very much work. Um, as we as we start to talk about the phases of this thing, uh, different leadership, uh, the way the styles changed, I, I would say maybe the styles perhaps changed based on the leadership. Um, when AJ was out and Kenny Omega came into power, as it were, um, I will admit at the time I knew all about 
the blow up dolls and the brooms and the dress up and the cosplay. A lot of stuff that a certain Jim Cornette rants about to this day. Uh, when Kenny Omega came in, the first thing I saw when I saw him was the first thing I said when I saw him was that's the guy that worked the little girl who later turned out to be uh Riho in AEW. Right. And I'm like, huh, he worked the little girl. Yeah. Suddenly I don't care about bullet club right now. And <laughs> you know, I, I had a conversation before we went live here. or started recording today that, with someone else about, you know, is Kenny Omega one of the best in the world? I have never believed so. I have no hate for the guy. Um, it's never been a disrespect intended. He's just not my flavor when it comes to top level, main event, best in the world. I feel like it's too much of a character. I feel like it's too theatric. I feel like there's a fine line that you can dance. And I feel like he dances all over it to the point of no return. Um. What did you think of his run as the guy at the front? And what do you think about the idea of sometimes he's a little bit too, too far over the line? Um, well, see, I, I know Kenny is hit or miss for people. And I, when I first came into the elite version and elite is Kenny and the young bucks. Yes. Um, now, I mean, coming in the door, the young bucks are also very hit or miss because they are very, you know, um, looking, looking, um, looking right at you the whole time, winking most of the time, and it's all breaking the fourth wall. And for people that want to be immersed, like they don't want that. And I feel like Kenny's the same way. Like Kenny is gonna do things that might be funny, but some people are like, nope, 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 nope. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to let us in on the gag. We're not supposed to be in on the joke. And so I think some people don't appreciate that about him. I appreciate it to a degree. Sometimes his humor works for me. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but in terms of match quality, uh, you'd be hard, you, you'd be hard pressed to say that Kenny didn't propel bullet club into a position as main eventers. Like everything he was doing with Okada was just spectacular. Those matches are all time. Great matches, instant classics. Um, and, I had kind of taken a, a, a backseat to watching all of the Bullet Club and New Japan stuff, but when I started watching again, after he had done all of the uh, junior heavyweight stuff and then the IC belt stuff, but once he started moving into being a heavyweight, I feel like that's when he came into his own as head of the Bullet Club. Um, and then, of course, the group got bigger and bigger. You've got all this kind of moving pieces to it. But I feel like he... Like I said, once he became a heavyweight, that's when it really took off under him. And man, his body changed, didn't it? It seemed like overnight yes. he he was a, a streamlined junior heavyweight to this bulked up, you know, chunk of iron. Look like I mean, he was sculpted, and I'm like, God, this guy lives in the freaking gym at this point. Like, uh. And honestly, if you listen to interviews with the guy apart from the business, he doesn't really talk much about living in the gym. But I'm like, look at your body, man. Like, oh, my God, he bulked up like crazy. I mean, you have to if you're going to go heavyweight, especially in that country. It was just like Will Ospreay did much later on. But, yeah, dude, he changed his look, dyed his hair silver, yeah. started wearing the dark shades. And I'm telling you, man, there's something about it. There's moments of that where he's got his head cocked back and he's chewing the toothpick. And I'm like, uh, it's, like it's, it's almost too kitsch. Like, it's yes, like, yes. It's almost too kitsch. It's like, it's almost, you could just tell it's a shtick and it's like, it just doesn't work. <laughs> but, but it's only because of him that it's work. And, and I mean, some of his heel stuff, um, I know some people are like, it's just too goofy to take seriously. But to me, when he's just being a colossal dork and just being <laughs> it's just being like really ridiculous, I think that's when he's at his best as a heel. I mean, perfect example was AEW when he did the thing for BTE and he did the uh like right when the Wednesday night stuff started and um um uh, Dijakovic 
um, tweeted that thing, and he he did the bit on on BT. It was like, yeah, here we go, Dominic Dominic Dickheads on on his on his Twitter machine typing away, and he this is gonna give me the TV time towel. Like that stuff is hilarious. When he's doing that, that that that's when he's at his best. <laughs> Well, listen, you said kitchen. It's 100% true. But the funny thing is about this, man, is that that stuff fits in Japan. That over-the-top, yes. animated, you know, a little bit too much to be believed totally fits in that country. So it's no wonder he got over to the point that he did. Yeah, and I think he was just, once he started putting on those on those great matches, it's like you just couldn't deny him at that point. Um and I, I feel like he elevated Bullet Club to a point where it was just almost hard to boo them at that point. Because, I mean, as much as I liked AJ's Bullet Club, like, there was no getting around. They were heels. They were straightforward heels. Um, and that was kind of the thing I didn't like about the elite Bullet Club. I felt like they got too likable. They got too, um, they got too crowd-pleasing. And I felt like that's not what Bullet Club was. That's not what um, Devitt intended it to be. Um, and so once they got out, that's why I enjoyed the cutthroat era when some, uh, Jay took over because it was more of, we're unlikable heels. We're not doing anything you want us to do We're we want to be booed. hundred percent agree. Couldn't agree more. And by evidence of the fact that when Jay starts off a match, when the bell rings, Jay gets out of the ring. He never starts working right away because he wants the crowd to hate him. Yeah. And man, has it worked. I mean, oh, man, it, <laughs> crazy. I, I don't want to jump in and gush too much over the cutthroat era because I feel like there's so many things they did once Jay took over that really, really took Bullet Club to a point where it's like, oh, well, this is probably over because they all, they lost all of the good members to the group, um, to AEW, so this is over, and the way they managed to completely revitalize Bullet Club after that and still make them like a prevalent part of New Japan is crazy. Uh, I say you can't gush enough. I think Jay has been a breath of fresh air. The first time I saw that guy, uh, when he came back from excursion, he was there. And, you know, it was before he grew the beard and everything, before he was really chiseled. Um, and he had that run in with Kenny. He had joined Chaos, and he was. Uh, they had a group picture of them with their titles, and it was awesome. And it's one of the best pics ever. Uh, and I still, I got that thing saved somewhere because it's such a cool photo. And uh, uh, listen, we sound like a massive uh, fan, a dork myself. I can't help it. But uh, there's something about the guy. He has style. He has flair. He has swagger. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like. He's got the thing. If you could bottle that stuff and sell it to to pro wrestling trainees, God, you'd make a million dollars in a year. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, that New Year Dash, um, when Kenny offered him the shirt, and then he like um, he acts like he's gonna take it, and then when he turns around, he gives him the Blade Runner. That was <laughs> yes. fantastic. Isn't that the same New Year Dash where um, Jericho showed up and they had like that big pull apart with um, with Naito? I think it is. I think you're right. Yeah, that was a great New Year Dash. Um, yeah, I mean, outside of, like, of course, the New Year Dash where um, Omega and the Bucks turned on AJ, like, that's one of my favorite New Year Dash. Well, listen, you, you brought this up, and I'm so glad you did because we had the word popularity and Bullet Club, they just go together at this point, right? But you brought it up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you your thoughts on this because you know me, I'm old school. I'm old school a lot in the way I think about the business. To me, a heel is a heel is a heel is a heel. Period. A yeah. heel doesn't a heel doesn't work for a face pop. A heel doesn't a heel is not funny to the point of being entertaining. I, I still think that that's pushing it too far. I think again, there's a fine line you can dance, and then you don't dance over the line. For God's sake, don't dance over the line. Um, what do you think about, especially during Omega's era, when even guys like Chase Owens? coming down the ramp and giving the two sweet to fans in in the front row. I mean, every time I see that, I cringe. I'm like, yeah, why? because they're wearing a Bullet Club t-shirt. You should point to them and say, hey, you're not good enough to be wearing that t-shirt. You should take it off, pal. Because your heels, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, of course I will say that was one of the most funnest. That was the most fun time to be a Bullet Club fan. I mean, 
Because the thing with Bullet Club, like, once it really took off and you could see the shirts everywhere, I mean, there was a point where there was no WWE show you could go, you could see where the camera did pan across and there weren't a ton of Bullet Club shirts in, in, the, in the show. I mean, there were shows I had gone to and I would always see Bullet Club shirts. Right. Um, and it just was something cool about it. It's like, I guess because it's a Japan thing and it's not such a mainstream thing, it's kind of one of those, um, if you know, you know things. And I mean, I've been out places where I didn't have a Bullet Club shirt on, but I saw someone across with a Bullet Club shirt and they like point across to me and hit me with a two sweet. And like, it's just cool. Like, and I mean, when All, All In is, was here in Chicago and I went, um, I went and caught the, caught the train and I had Bullet Club shirt on. And I mean, there's just so many Bullet Club fans everywhere. I mean, just everybody just had a good time and like, it was a blast to be a part of that. And I mean, talk about just them getting big enough and getting big enough to do their own indie show and just all the energy that it was around that time. It was just crazy. It was just a great time to be a wrestling fan. Um, and so I can't, you know, that part about it is cool. But at the same time, Bullet Club to me is unlikable. They're not crowd pleasers. Like, and like I said, it was a blast to be around. But like, to me, they got too, they got too, um, I don't know, too fun loving at the time. <laughs> like it was just too much yeah. of, you know, we're marked for ourselves at the time. And I yeah, mean, like, yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Like some of that stuff is great. I love some of the matches from that era. But man, I was in, uh, where was I? I, I was in, I was in Cali for the New Japan show here when the um when the firing squad came out and turned on the elite and Tamatanga comes out and the Haku comes out and he's like, <laughs> and they're just like beating them down. And it was great. It was amazing. <laughs> That's good stuff. Taking the group back, man, taking the group back. Like, I mean, so, uh, does this group work then now or tomorrow without Tamatanga and Tongaloa? I mean, Tama, you could argue the point that Tama's the heart of this thing. I mean, you're right when you said that Anderson is important to it. Absolutely right. Can't argue that. But next to him, there's Tama, who, if anybody represents Bullet Club attitude and swagger and personality, I mean, it's Tama Tonga, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to say that um, Gallows and Anderson were like the New Age outlaws, I would liken Tama Tonga to like X Pac because he has like such a style to him. He has like mm -hmm. this, he has like legitimate heat. Like when, when he first turned on them and he was coming up and he was doing all of the, he was doing all like all of the promos and he was coming up and just doing all of the, <laughs> all of the shenanigans. Like what I, I think it was the G one he was in that year and he kept like just getting disqualified in all of the matches and it just was fantastic. You could just tell he wanted to get booed and it was like <laughs> it was fun to laugh at him because it was just all of, everything he was doing at the time was hysterical. But at the time it was like like the G one is known for being like, you know, this five star match factory. So you've got him like messing it up. It's like, no, no, you've got to finish the match. You gotta have a good match. And it's kinda like he knew he knew when they jumped the lead that everybody was like, oh, now Thomas next up. He's going to be the leader. He's going to move up and he's going to be like heavyweight champion. And so he had to know going into the G1 that everybody was going to be rooting for him to win the G1 and challenge for a big championship. But this is how ingenious Thomas Tong is. He was like, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm going to get disqualified in every match. I'm going to scrum up everything. I'm going to come in and I'm going to cut a promo on everybody you love. You're supposed to hate me. You guys forgot that. Oh my God. Absolutely right. And he did the right thing for that group and for himself. You know, I wonder as we sit here and talk about Tama, it seems to be a perfect fit that he is the guy in the front. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Tombstone. And the line where uh, uh, where they tell Johnny Ringo, man, even I'm worried about what happens when Johnny Ringo takes out over this outfit. God have mercy. Because it's the idea of, you don't let Johnny Ringo run the Cowboys. Have you lost your mind? That that's, This thing's going to go down in flames. 
So with Thomas' character and how he's such a loose cannon, imagine him being at the front of this, and my God, they it and, and just allowing them to go his speed and his direction. I mean, utter chaos and anarchy, the likes of which this Bullet Club has probably never even seen before, dude. Yeah, and I mean, he didn't take the reins of leader once the elite was ousted, but he wrote he. He righted the ship. He was kind of like, nope, you guys are supposed to hate us. I'm going to make sure you guys hate us. I don't want to be the leader, but here's Jay. I brought in Jay. Here's Bone Soldier. Here's, um, uh, who else? He brought in someone else recently. And I was like, this is, all everything he's done since the Elite left has been just fantastic. And I think he should be credited a lot as well as um, um, Jay with just, reinventing the group in some ways or bringing it back to its roots. Kenta, that's who I was thinking of. Of course, Kenta. how did I forget that? That The Kenta turn on on <laughs> Shibata is fantastic. And that was another reason why the Cutthroat Era just, there were just so many moments they did at the Cutthroat Era that was just like, the Bullet Club's back. This is what they always were. Jesus, don't get me started on Shibata. When Shibata ran down the aisle and jumped Kenta in the crowd, you could hear the crowd go, oh, because oh, they'd, ne- they'd not seen Shibata lay hands on anyone in how many, how long? I mean, months, a year, two years? How long had it been? Because they let the company let it be known. He's done. Shibata cannot work again. It's over. Yeah. And then he, my God, that says a lot for Shibata, obviously, but also says a lot for Kenta because he was so hated because yeah. it was, like you said, how dare you betray you know, the fans, how dare you betray Shibata's trust and allegiance like this? I mean, that that started, I mean, Kent has got to be forever grateful for, to Shibata for getting his his fuse sparked at that turn that night. Man, I mean, there's so many great things about it. The uh, the drop kick in the corner he does, and the, like hand oh. just, he does afterwards, like he's throwing out the trash, like, get out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That Man. all of that was just great. I mean, what you're talking about a guy, when just like we said earlier, and just knowing, you know, when is the time to do something for the Heat and to better the group, and just Kenta joining them and just doing everything to be hated. I mean, when he comes out at the end of Wrestle Kingdom last year and kneels on on like the most beloved babyface at the time in Naito, and he's got both his belts, like that is to me, one of the best pitchers in pro wrestling over the last decade. <laughs> it's just so I great. agree with that. <laughs> yeah. I agree with that. Totally. He, uh, I gotta be honest with you. I, I, I did not really know Kenta before he became Hideo Itami. Uh, truth be told, I didn't, I didn't know enough of his work. I'd seen brief clips. I didn't know enough to appreciate nor respect what he could do. I saw him as a day with Tommy, and for the first 10 minutes of that, I was like, hey. And then it was like, oh, because he gets hurt. They don't know what to do with him, and it becomes a thing. So when he shows up in New Japan, I'm like, well, you know what? This is cool. And then they turn him, and I'm like, okay, the turn was awesome, but now he's going to be throwing the too sweet, and he's never going to smile again. I'm like, oh, it's the AJ Styles thing. Now he's going to grow the beard and dye his hair, and he's going to, oh, God, come on. But then he pulled it off. Like he's as much a part of that group now as I think any of them are, dude. I think he fit right in. You talked about a guy that I think had like the best glow up since he left WWE. Kenta's definitely got to be on that list. Um, oh yeah, he's had like the best two or three years since since then, and I mean he's been he's been killing it. I mean, because the thing is, it just. Just everything they did with it, and you know, this is part of you have to credit Gato and just New Japan and how smart they are with how they um, tell stories. Um, you bring a guy in, in in Kenta, and I knew of Kenta from like the Daniel Bryan matches. Um, I wasn't a um, Noah. That's where he's from. Uh, I, right, I, right. I wasn't a Noah guy, um, but I I've seen you know, all, some of his random matches online sometimes. Like, I saw some of the Daniel Bryan matches and some other random matches every every Blue Moon. Um, So when he comes into WWE, he looks like a huge star. Like, he is, he is what they wanted 
Well, let me get that. Let me turn it around. Shinsuke is what they wanted Kenta to be in a lot of ways because he was like this renowned star when he came in and you managed to do all these great things and put all these titles on him. That's what they wanted for Kenta and it just never happened. And so his four years or however long here, I'm sure it was longer than four years. I just, I don't have it in front of me. So <laughs> I'm sure yeah. I messed it up. I'm sure it probably felt longer to him too. Yeah, but his his uh, stint with WWE and it just ended just so disastrous. Um, having him on 205 Live and not really having a place for him. And then he left with no real equity that he came in with. And it's just kind of like, yeah, it looks like this is it. Like, he's probably going to do some shows here or there, and he's going to retire. And then he just shows up in New Japan. And it's like, okay, well, I'll take that. It, but at the same time, you've got this guy that has been a nowhere guy for a lifer. And, you know, in Japan, you don't really switch feds. You don't do that. It's kind of looked at as taboo. It's like disloyal. You just don't do that. Um, So you take a NOAA guy in in Kenta and you bring him to New Japan. So he's already not going to get over in the way that you want, but you've got him next to Shibata. So people want to warm up to him and they are smart enough where they're like, Nope, they're not going to warm up to him. They don't like this guy. Let's make them hate him. (laughs) Right. And, you know, much in the same way that Jay turned on chaos and Okada, uh, when, when Kenta turned on Kazuyori Shibata, I mean, that's, that's, when you've got a guy like Shibata who is as beloved as he is and as well respected as he is, I mean, if you look at that guy the wrong way in that country, you're a bona fide top level heel, much less, you know, put him through the mat. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it, it started him off on the right foot as a heel in the Bullet Club. Uh, El Fantasma uh, is as much of a dirty, no good, rotten, stinking scoundrel heel. I think that can exist today in 2021. I mean, he's even if he's not with Bullet Club, this is the same character this guy should run all the time because he is so unlikable. It is insane, dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, yeah, I just could not imagine him being a face at this point because he. Like, all this stuff he did in the Super J Cup, it's like, you already know going into it. You got fan favorites in this thing, like ACH and Leo Rush and um, Chris Bay. And he's just, like, cheating to beat these guys, and he's just rubbing it in. Wins, gets the gold jacket, and just throws it, crushes the trophy over his knee. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, even everything he did at Wrestle Kingdom, like, I think he understands, like, I'm doing these amazing things. Like, I'm, like, the the rope walk he did in that match was just oh my God. incredible. Like, I mean, it looks so smooth and perfect. And he knows he's doing all these things that are, like, awe-inspiring. And people are like, man, this guy's a great, great wrestler. Then he'll just turn around and do something dickish. And people are like, oh, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you got to get that heat back, man. You got to get the heat back and he knows exactly how to do it. I mean, he's yeah. I, 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 it's one of those things where you shouldn't like him at all cause he's so hateable, but I don't know. There's a level of respect that comes for, um, for that kind of work being put in to make an entire crowd, you know, 20 some thousand people just rain down hell on his head because he's got it coming because he's that much of a douche. I mean, it's just, I don't know, dude. I, I think he fits it uh, perfectly. On the flip side of that conversation, and and I love this guy's work. I think the Bone Soldier thing is fine. But Taiji Ishimori, in in my opinion, is, is a million-dollar babyface main event guy waiting to happen. Oh, yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'm wrong, but... Is that the sense you get from that guy? I I think it's only a matter of time before he either does something with New Japan where he's a baby face or he's signed somewhere else and he's a baby face. Um, he's just so good. He's so innovative. Um, when I saw Shinsuke start doing his like sliding German that he does where he slides out of the ring and does that German suplex, like yeah. that's when I was like, yeah, this guy is just, he's doing so many things that are just influential. Um, for his age and just just for 
I mean, just for a junior heavyweight, like, because you don't see a lot of um, people talk about, like, just how um, big the junior heavyweight division has gotten over the last few years. Um, and that's because of guys like Kushida and uh, and Osprey and those other guys, of course. But, man, I I definitely think when you're looking at the juniors, a guy that could come up and do, like, never open weight stuff or other stuff, it I definitely think Ishimori could. Well, okay, so that begs this question then. We've seen uh, Shingo Takagi go from junior, which he probably never should have been, yeah, go from junior. <laughs> no, no. Shingo goes from junior to heavyweight. We've seen Will Ospreay do it and, and bulked up and muscled up, and, man, he looks amazing now. And his, he's he fits his frame perfectly. So we know it can be done. Omega did it too. Yeah. But is Ishimori tall enough to be considered, like, can you envision this guy being IWGP champion one day? Uh, maybe not, because he's he's kind of short, and that's why I said I can definitely see him doing some never open weight stuff. Um, yeah, I I think he's too short for what they would consider um, a, a main champion, because all of their main champions are kind of tall, and if they're not tall, they're big, huge guys. Right. Yeah, I just I just get the sense from this guy that he is. I I don't want to say he's acting because that sounds like it's it's dissing him because I don't want to diss him. I just feel like okay, I'm part of the book club. I got to frown and I got to wear black and I got to throw the sign. I I like El Fantasmo lives it, and Ishimori it it's just it's his role to play. So, yeah. I could you know, I and kind I I felt the same thing with Robbie Eagles, and the minute Robbie Eagles turns on them, you're like. Oh God! It's like a breath of fresh air. This kid is—he's a freaking made to be babyface, man. You know what I mean? Absolutely. He's yeah. He makes a ton of sense as a babyface. Um, so I was glad when he turned. He, he he just made perfect sense, especially when he was like teaming with Osprey at first. I thought that was a great tag team. Makes perfect sense. Um, Ishimori, I think when he was doing the stuff with uh, Kushida when he was there, I think he was doing some good heel stuff there. But that was mostly off the backs of um, uh, Tama hyping him up, <laughs> and True. that just that just shows you that Tama is just the glue. He's like he was the glue that made the Cutthroat era work at first. Yeah, I agree with that. You're right. He's the one that kind of brings them all together, and he's the one that puts the focus back where it needs to be. He's the general of the thing. I mean, they they can call bad luck Fale. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know where I'm going. It's the line that's always quoted. It's the the Battle of New Japan. I love that line. There's something about that that's so funny. Yeah. Show this man respect. You know, uh, he fought in the war, but uh, <laughs> Fale, man, Fale's not going to win any awards for being Wrestler of the Year anytime soon. Um, no. Tom Clark Six M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1 800 519 5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. However, Fale has his own dojo, and he's training guys. And n- there's no redeeming qualities about Fale at all. If the idea is I got to be the big nasty heel, he's doing a, he's doing a good job of that. I mean, yes. Where would you rank him in terms of big man working today? Is he? I think he's fairly effective. Um, what's your take on that? I think he's effective. I don't think he is what he was before. Like when he had that G one run. Where he had the he had the match with um, Shinsuke, like I yes. think that was him at his best. Um, I don't think he's been that in a while. And I he's been in worse shape than he is now, but I think I don't think the weight gain helped him at all. Uh, because when Devitt first brought him in, man, he was in great shape. He was a what a former rugby player, I think. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, he was he was basically what almost is for AJ now. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, man. And, you know, 
I like him a lot, and I think he fits. I think the combination of him and Chase Owens is so freaking different. Because you got Fale, who I think is from New Zealand, I think. Um, yeah. And you've got yeah. Owens, who's from South Carolina or, or or West Virginia, maybe. It's like, how are these two guys a tag team? But then you see them and are like, well, that's not bad. Like, they just, you know, they, they team up in, in random teams sometimes because it's a book club and that's how they roll. But, you know, I think it's effective enough, and uh, they seem to have fairly good chemistry. And Owens just seems to be having so much fun every time he's in the ring. Yeah. And uh, I, th- I think he fits the club as well, honestly. Right. Um, yeah. Um, you talk about a guy that shouldn't work in a club, and he's just so outlandish. Right. And he just works <laughs> as, uh, as Yujiro Takahashi, man. He's just so <laughs> – like, like, man, what is – it's almost sometimes when he comes out, he's doing like the whole Tokyo pimp thing, and he's yes. got um, he's got like his dancer with him, and it's just like this just looks so ridiculous, but it just works. I don't know why it works, but it works. <laughs> and he's got that stupid cane and the stupid smile, and he's got the little he's wearing the derby and the sunglasses, and you're like Tokyo yeah. pimp. Okay, what's this? It's- yeah, it just makes it so easy to hate him. Like when he first jumped out and he was with the elite and he wasn't with the OGs, I'm like, no, you got to get him back with the bad guys because he just doesn't work as well as a good guy. Because it's like you just want to boo this guy. Yes, <laughs> it's just so it's 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 hilarious because he's funny enough where you kind of want to like him too, but it's just like no, nah, no, this, <laughs> you just want to not like this guy, man. Well, I mean, if you're joining at the hip with with Peter. Peter or Peter, whatever they refer to her. I mean, I tend to not see Takahashi too much when she's out there, if I'm being real. Uh, <laughs> because, wow. And uh, one day I'm watching this back before everything hit with the crowds disappearing and whatnot. And my wife walks into the room. She goes, okay. And because Peter is out there and she's basically completely nude. Uh, and, and I just looked at her and I just shrugged my shoulders and I said, it's Japan. It's a different thing. Yeah. And she, she's like, oh, come on. I said, no, no. I said, there's no men in that crowd going nuts right now. I said, it's, I said, if, if they try, if any company tried this in America, it, it, there'd be cat calling. There would be obscene things being said and yelled and screamed. People trying to touch her. And I said, in Japan, it's a show. It's just a show. And, and there's respect for the performers in Japan. Like we don't see in the States. I'm sorry, kids. It's the truth. Yeah. And you know, it, it it's just part of the show, but yeah, that's what makes her work is because the thing is like their whole thing as a as a stable is they are doing everything that is like seen as faux pas for Japan Japanese wrestling. Right. And you know, having coming out with a woman and it's just seen as disgraceful and so it's kind of like what are you doing? And it's like he's got this he's like she's half naked and she's like dancing all like if you notice in New Japan, all of the heels have women ballets. Um, like bringing in B Priestley for what Osprey is doing right now is just genius because it's the same thing. It's like she's, and not to make it seem like oh it's a woman boo, but it's like <laughs> it's just the way that they position it. It's like the way they do it is, is it works, and that's why Tokyo Pimp works. Like they're. It's the same thing with um with Tai Chi and he has his ballet. Yes. Tai Chi and that glorious singing voice he has. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's still one on me. I have no idea. Maybe one day we'll do a Suzuki Goon episode. That might be fun too. That would be fun. I I love Suzuki Goon. I, I do too. I just love just how easy it is to hate all of those guys too. <laughs> it's just it's just yeah. Okay, so all right, uh, nice segue here. Um, what separates apart? All right, and I guess popularity is the separation. Suzuki Goon is got to be the most reprehensible, most vile, most despicable faction in New Japan. We have yet to see what Osprey can do with the Empire and really build it up to that level. But Suzuki Goon's it, yeah. And the fans got a lot of love uh, for Suzuki, and they should. But man, for the rest of those cats, forget it. So how does a Bullet Club, 
Is it the, the logo and the hand gesture and the T-shirts? I mean, that's the biggest difference. Plus, they like to smile at the camera and they like to give the two sweet to fans. And I mean, I guess you could say that Bullet Club is like Suzuki Goon light to a certain extent. Well, I think Bullet Club has always had things that make them intrinsically cool. Like, I mean, I mean, coming in the door, you had Devitt coming out there and he had the light up jacket. Yeah. Um, and he was so liked for the light up jacket. He was like, I can't do this. Like I have to, that's why he started doing the paint. Cause he was trying to find another way to do something where I don't need the jacket, but I, it's still something visually appealing. And then the paint ended up getting over. And so I think that's the thing with bullet club. Like they're always been intrinsically cool because visually they just look cool. And I think that was the same thing when AJ was leading, like he would come down and he would do all of the gun gestures and, then he just have like all of them behind him waving a flag and it just looked cool. Yeah. Like, like each guy has had his own niche, brought his own flavor to the club. Right. So, uh, I mean, you could definitely say that too about, about Devitt and about AJ and Jay White and Kenny Omega. What's your take on, and we haven't covered this guy yet. Former Los and Gerben mainstay evil because man you either believe that it was a failed attempt or you think everything's cool so where do you come down on this because a lot of people are saying man what were they thinking he does not fit this does not work because they seem to get behind him in the beginning and now not so much well you had to do something because they had to stop a lot of shows Right, And you've got to come up with somebody that is going to get you to absolutely boo them if they're going against um, Naito. And so once you have them win the New Japan Cup, and then the turn was great. The turn at the end of New Japan Cup was fantastic. He agreed to give them the, the hand gesture and then he too sweeps them. That was great. Uh, but see, once you give them that much heat and everything, you can't then come out of the New Japan Cup and have him lose. And so that's why I always understood him cheating and beating, beating Naito. Um, because you still have to, you, you can't you can't make him a toothless threat right away. Um, so like pairing him with Dick Togo and um, doing all of this stuff after New Japan Cup. And and he, he ended up being such a good heel that when Naito wins the titles back and then he's got like the fireworks behind him at that um, big show they did at the baseball field, that all worked because of evil. And it was the same way that um, Okada's big win here at um, Madison Square Garden worked because Jay White was such a good heel. So I think like evil is just intrinsically a heel. Like There's certain things about him that he just works better as a heel. Um, I mean, yeah, he's cool and low sim and gabernables and he's cool and he's doing like the tag team stuff with Sonata, but that had grown stale to me. I think you had to get him away from Sonata and you had to make Sonata a singles guy. Like that's been, it seems like that's been in the making for a long time to make Sonata like the guy. Um, so it, the way to do that was to get evil away from him and to make evil the opposite. Cause he always was the opposite. That's why they kind of worked as a tag team because they kind of just composed against each other. Like they could, they clash so, so hard stylistically and you know i just i'm sitting here imagining uh if if evil had been if he was uh cutting promos in english his first promo after returning on lij is you know they call me evil right that's kind of my <laughs> name like what did you think was going to happen like that would have been money to me um yeah I, I i get where you're coming from you know that they had to they had to go with someone that was absolutely going to be booed and also they had to go with someone that was actually going to be there and wasn't stuck right. in the states or stuck in right. australia or stuck in new zealand so um i don't know if i've decided yet um how i feel about it i'm not against it per se i just don't know if it's if it's pushed the right buttons for me do you find it interesting though that there's not been, and, and he and Jay have kind of been ships passing in the night. One will kind of talk about the other in a promo, and then the other one, you know. I mean, are we going to get to a point where there's going to be an inevitable collision of like, look, this is my club now, not yours, like we had with Omega and Cody, who we have yet to talk about. I mean, do you think that's coming for Jay and Evil? I think a split's definitely coming. I mean, they've 
thrown teases that certain people side with evil and certain people side with Jay. Um, like even at Wrestle Kingdom, like Ishimori had the little extension in his hair that was purple. Um, it just little touches like that are cool, but yeah, I think it's definitely coming. Um, the the thing I will say that worked with Evil is his new theme music is absolutely awesome. Like it's just yeah. so epic and over the top. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, I mentioned Cody. Uh, we don't have to go deep on this. Did Cody work for you in being in the Bullet Club? Ah, uh, he didn't necessarily work. And again, I think that was kind of once Bullet Club started jumping the shark, kind of. Um, I don't. I think he worked right as a heel. Um, when he was doing all the stuff with ROH, and he had like the uh ring, the physical Ring of Honor. He was making people kiss the ring, and um, some of the stuff he was doing at Wrestle Kingdom that year with Ibushi, like um. Brandy getting pushed off of the apron and then them laughing hysterically once he found out it was Axe. Like all of that stuff worked for me, but that's just a that's just a indication of how good he can work as a heel. But we already knew that from his WWE time that he could work good as a heel. Oh yeah. But he's just I don't think he ever fit as a bullet club because he's kind of too I don't want to say too clean cut. For Bullet Club, because Bullet Club always felt like kind of gr- gruff and kind of dirt under the fingernails. Um, even though you've got somebody just like as good looking as Devitt at the head of the thing, but when he was doing it, I mean, he was just cursing a lot and he had like the really sick accent. It was just like it worked for him because at the time, like he's a totally different guy when he's a heel. Like we've seen like quiet and understated Finn, and he's a face, but. As a heel, he's totally different. I mean, you see that in NXT as well. Oh, yeah. um, but that's why I'm like, I don't know. I just, I never really bought into Cody. And I I know some people that were like, he didn't fit in New Japan. I don't think it's that he didn't fit in New Japan. I think Bullet Club just never felt like his thing. Now, I did enjoy the stuff with him and Omega. Um, but yeah, as a member of Bullet Club, I can't say he was one of my favorites. <laughs> Well, I mean, we have yet to talk about the uh, maybe the guy that is the best Bullet Club member of all time. Um, the one that I don't know how we get through this whole show without even mentioning his name. Because, man, if you want to talk about an era of Bullet Club that needs to be talked about, that'd be the Slap Nuts era of the Bullet Club. <laughs> because it's. J double A double what the hell are we doing? So I had forgotten he was in this thing. And there's a good reason why I forgot because wow. I mean, how much do you know about Jeff Jarrett and the freaking bullet club, man? I remember when he debuted because I remember when he uh didn't he uh cheat in the Okada match? It was one of those title matches that he helped um AJ win. Yes. Um and I remember that stuff, and then like he like got thrown out like a few shows later. Um, he wasn't in that long, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, it was just one of those random things. Like, why? What is this? Like, why is he here? <laughs> it was weird. Um, yeah, it's been a few random members of Bullet Club like that. Like, okay, why? What? What is this? Uh, Cody Hall. There's a random member for you. Yeah, yeah. It's also I- real random. I kind of felt bad for Cody. Uh, I don't know, man. He he did the too sweet thing. His dad was a freaking founding member of the original NWO, for God's sake. He wore gear identical to what Scott Hall wore. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just kept thinking, man, if there's anybody that should pull Cody Hall aside and have a heart to heart, it's Cody Rhodes. And, and maybe it maybe it happened. I don't know. Yeah. Um. I don't know that Cody Hall is even still in the business. Have you heard anything about this guy? I haven't seen him wrestling anywhere. I think he's done. Yeah. I th- I think maybe he is too. Uh, man. I I tell you, one of my up and coming members of Bullet Club, where I feel like this guy is like on the cusp of being great, is uh Hikaleo. I I really like Hikaleo. I do too. Yeah, and and he was a hard sell for me in the beginning because. He was green as grass, uh, and in my opinion, in the ring before he should have been, maybe on a national platform. Yeah. Um, 
But I think they saw that too, and they they pulled him out. And I think hasn't he been on excursion this whole time? I want to say, apart from twenty twenty, obviously. Well, I know he got injured, and that's why he was off TV for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. And then he went on excursion, and he was doing stuff with Progress, I think. Mm, I think right. it, was, it, it was one of those UK promotions. If it wasn't Progress, um, I'm pretty sure it was Progress, because um, I keep wanting to say Defiant, but Defiant's gone. Yeah, he uh, and and he should be good. I mean, he, he's got a great pedigree here, and uh, I want him to succeed. I I think for the longest time he looked like, well, uh, to, from my perspective, it was like, okay, this this kid's body is too big for him to even know what to do with it. Like he just looked awkward, and I kept yeah. thinking, though, man, if he ever comes into that body, and if he ever inhabits completely inhabits that frame, and makes it work. Oh my God, we're talking about, you know, Undertaker type of athleticism if he can get there. I mean, whether or not he'll get there, I don't know, but I'm with you. I think his upside is tremendous right now. Yeah, I mean, looked really awkward at first. Um, having him do the stuff with GOD um, was kind of not working. Um, but then when he got hurt, and then, like I said, he went away for all that time, got an Got in incredible shape. <laughs> Hair is super long now. He just guy looks like a million bucks. Um, he's moving a lot better in the ring. Um, and I think the heel stuff he's doing in the bits that I've seen with um the New Japan um in America stuff, New Japan Strong stuff, it was great. Yeah, and I I mean I'm uh I'm happy for the kid that he's he's actually getting to uh try to get his feet under him. It's no no short uh. Uh, it's it's no small task, I guess I should say, in order to follow in your father's footsteps in any walk of life. Yeah. It's hard enough. It's hard enough for us regular guys, kids. Imagine being a pro wrestler's son and having that shadow looming large over your life every day. I mean, it's got to be. I mean, look at where Cody Rhodes has come um, versus where he was when he was just running with Randy Orton and uh, Ted DiBiase Jr. I mean, it was. You know, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago now. He's really become his own man. And, yeah, you know, we'll see if it happens for Hikaleo. I, I do hope it happens for him. Um, we A couple guys we didn't mention here. Hangman Page, obviously. Uh, the whole elite stuff was going on. He was a member of the team at that time. I remember the club. Um, Marty Skrull, who we haven't mentioned, who I thought fit in perfectly. He's already the villain, for crying out loud. Uh you know, not a popular thing to be talking about Skrull right now. I get it, but it's a shame because, man, a guy that was built to be on the stage in some capacity is Marty Skrull. I mean, got the look, got the personality, got the showmanship. Yeah. I mean, had his own faction in Ring of Honor and was killing it, killing it. I went to live Ring of Honor events and Villain Enterprises was the hardest, the hottest thing on the card, and should have been main event every time I went. Yeah, uh, man, the, the Marty stuff is sad, and I don't want to say sad like, oh, you know, he doesn't deserve what's happening to him. I don't want to do that. It's sad, yeah. and it's just disappointing. Um, man, you talk about a guy. When I said earlier that you know all of these Bullet Club guys have, you know. Or just look so cool visually. You're talking about a guy that had the visuals, like the masks, the 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 suits, and the the jackets and the top hats. Always looked fantastic coming out. His entrance always looked great. Uh, his uh, Wrestle Kingdom entrance, where he had the big giant wings. Ah, oh, it's just all. So oh my cool. god! Yeah, for sure. The the and then could wrestle really well. His match with Okada um, at All In is still one of my favorite matches I've seen live. Uh, man, and just ah, just whatever doing personal stuff in his personal life to just kind of piss it away. But man, you're talking about a guy that I thought was going to be a humongous star, um, here here in America. He just had all the makings of a star. Um, so much so when they did the G1 Supercard, I was sitting here like they put the title on Taven, like this, <laughs> right. Marty Skrull is right there. This was the night in Mar- in Madison Square Garden. You should have made Skrull champion. And for whatever reason, they didn't do it that night. It was weird. 
<laughs> I, I always liken that move to giving it to Jericho over Austin and the rock. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you got to feel bad for Taven. Who's just like, wait a minute, you're going to give it to me. Like, I'm sure at some point that was said and you know, kudos to Matt Taven for taking the best of a really weird situation and, and doing everything or taking the worst of it and just doing the very best he could with it. And I think Taven has a bright future myself um, because he is very good. And uh, he was yeah. just in a, in an odd spot, but yeah, I'm with you, man. Marty had, uh, there was every sign that this guy was going to be huge. And there was WWE rumors flying around for a while. There was a picture of him and somebody in a locker room somewhere. I want to say it was Regal, but I could be wrong. And I kept thinking, Oh God, no, Marty, no, no, no. Like they would have, they would have taken his gimmick and they would have spun it like they did with Matt Hardy. And he probably would have made some money and he probably would have had a little bit of spotlight, but I mean, I think we all know that, yeah, he was made for the stage. I, I stick by that. And maybe it would have been a much better than I could have imagined. But I don't know. He's a smaller guy. And how far would they really go with a smaller guy? To this day, I believe it pained them to put that title on Daniel Bryan twice. I, I think <laughs> the second, the first time was not done by design. It was done because they were pressured to do it. And the second time was because it was just about putting it on Cody, which is fine. But at the same time, I'm like, if you're a smaller guy in that company, you don't really have a prayer. Um, so I don't know. I guess we'll never know now what could have been for Marty, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's definitely was one of those guys that benefited a lot from being in the Bullet Club in that era. Um, I mean, it just did a lot for him in terms of turning him into a colossal star at that time. Uh, and I would say it did plenty for Hangman. Um, we could, yeah, I mean, we can have a whole conversation on how Hangman has completely turned his career around over the last year or so. Um, but I don't feel like Hangman ever took off in a way that he probably could have with New Japan because he never took off and got that big singles win. And he never had like the character that he has now. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I totally agree with that. He, uh, at first, it's like, let me get this straight. You're going to try to get over a Barry Windham gimmick in the year 2018 or whatever. And I'm like, are you serious? Like, I love Barry. I, I love the bunkhouse matches. I love Dusty. I love Magnum. I, I love the Midnight Rider. I love all that stuff. But like, in 2018, it doesn't work now. But Man, was I wrong, because it totally works. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love Paige, man. It wasn't about his work in the ring. It was about, you're going to try to get a cowboy gimmick over now? And yeah, he lives it. It's good stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. He just never really worked in, new, in, in Bullet Club as a bad guy. Um, I never really bought him as a heel. Um, I, I feel like he did good things as a heel, but I you could just see a good babyface turn for this guy. Um, and like you said, he looks like a guy, you're talking about a guy, if you were making a creative wrestler and you were putting together the, the guy that looked like an NWA champion from like 20, 30 years ago, that's, that's Hangman Page. He manages to get that look and then still wrestle like a contemporary wrestler because he does like the the shoot and start press and he does like all of the like um high spot stuff that where he can fit in this era very well. And so I never had any doubts on could he be good and you know, could you push this guy to the moon if if you had the chance. But it was just kinda like you've got him in Bullet Club and he's kinda trying to he just six dollars a store thumb thumb next to the rest of these guys. It doesn't look like a heel. The creative wrestler analogy is pitch perfect. Um, absolutely. So as we said before, uh, the bullet club is a Japanese gimmick. It is, it's home is new Japan. In my opinion, it's where it should stay. Yes. We've seen it in other companies. We've seen it in ring of honor. Um, we saw a half hearted, lazy version in WWE that was just called the club. It's the original club and the only club that matters. Uh, Okay, but it's not AJ Anderson and Gallows, folks. It's Devitt Anderson and Gallows. That would have been the original club. Um, yeah, okay. So 
we saw that AJ and and Finn worked one match and then they it's over. They never did anything. I'm like, okay, well, I I know why. It's not Vince's baby. And if it's not Vince's baby, he doesn't care. Funny thing to me, he brought the NWO back and he brings back ECW gimmicks and he brings back other stuff. I guess just so he can beat it and crap on it later, maybe? Yeah. Well, I have several thoughts on that. The WWE's just refusal to do anything that plays up a Bullet Club's popularity. It's so strange because, like I said, at at several points, there were so many Bullet Club shirts at their crowd. Like, enough that it was visible. Like, I mean... I mean, I don't know if people really realize it. Like, if you look at these shows from the outside in and you see just how big and sprawling these arenas are and how many people are in these things, and you can see all of these Bullet Club shirts littered around in there, like, that's a that's a pretty big deal. Um, and it just speaks to how popular Bullet Club had gotten. And to have four of the most popular members of this thing on your roster and just decide, nope, I'm not going to do anything with them together. It just doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. Um, especially because AJ and Finn never did anything while they were in Japan together. So it was just like, why not at least do something with them? At least pair them up as a tag team? Something. Oh, man. Wow. And she just yes. never, never did it. It's just so weird. They they never put the four of those guys together. And I know Gallows and Anderson have been on record saying like that was the biggest letdown and that was the biggest missed opportunity of their time with the company that they never did that. But it was right there. You've got, you've got two founding members. And then you've got, like I said, the four of them are four of the most well-known members of Bullet Club. And so it just seems like it writes itself. You didn't have to call them Bullet Club. You could have made it a, a you know, a, a joke on a Bullet Club. You could have did anything you wanted to do with it. But it was right there for you, and they just never did it. It's just weird. But, you know, part of it is, I think, some of it is Hunter. You know, I think Hunter at least seems like he resents the fact that they've gotten over with, like, things that the click started, like the wolf pack hand gesture and too sweet and you know at one point they were doing the suck it chance and they were doing all of those hand gestures as well and i think he hated that i think he hated the idea that these guys were so anti-wwe and they were taking things that were considered his and getting over with it right. and so i think he was like nope i'm not going to give you guys the satisfaction of coming over here and coming to wwe and doing it here but then at the same time, you do all this self-congratulatory stuff like having the club come together to beat up Revival in that match next to the click and having them do this huge group two sweep. And then you never move on from that and give them anything other than that. Yeah, or, you, gave, you gave them a rub and then didn't do anything with it. Or putting those four guys together and doing a match in Japan and it's AJ and the Good Brothers and Triple H in, New, in Japan wrestling. Why is Triple H in that group? Like, come on, man. It's like yeah. you want to, it almost feels like he wants all of the pat on the back of going, ha ha, I'm a part of this exclusive thing because I started the two sweet, but I'm never going to give them, I'm never going to give you guys what you actually want. I'm never going to give them the space to be great in this company. Well, he joined the Shield for a night, didn't he? Yes. I mean, <laughs> I it's, mean, it's baffling. It's It just doesn't make any sense and it, it, it it's one of those petty things where it just, it really feels like it was out of spite. We were never going to let them do exactly what they wanted. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I enjoy the club stuff. I enjoy the let's beat up John Cena stuff. I thought yeah. that stuff was fantastic. Um, but that's just a, that's just a credit to how well AJ worked with the good brothers and how they're good friends and they could get these things over. Um, and I thought they had something with Balor club too, but they never really, pushed it anywhere they never let them get a big win they never really did anything i don't know they never did anything with them as, as a trio um so i mean even if you're not looking at the fact that they could have got the four of those guys together and did something great they had chances with just aj and the good brothers or just finn and the good brothers and they never really did anything um i mean i enjoyed the oc 
for what it was because I just think those three guys are great as heels, but it just still didn't feel like Bullet Club. It just felt like watered down versions of what we knew they could be. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, it, it just always felt like, okay, we've got Anderson and Gallows and they're, they're sharp. They're very sharp. Uh, they're very smart. They're an excellent tag team. Hey, but they're funny. So let's just do that. So that's yeah. what they did. Cause that's, that's what yeah. they do. That's what they do. You know? And I mean, they can do the humor stuff and they've shown that in several points in their career. I mean, even with the new Japan thing, I still, one of the things that, <laughs> that put them over with me when I initially started watching in the AJ era was the, um, how they would overreact to getting kicked out. They would always just, <laughs> just overact to getting kicked out of the arena every time. New Red Shoes would kick them out, and they would just like throw these huge tantrums. It was always hilarious. Right. <laughs> so, you know, you know they can do humor stuff, but it's just like they can do so much more than that if you give them a chance, especially especially Anderson. He, You can let this guy talk. He's a great talker. Um they just never really did it. Um, I don't ever really feel like they pushed them like they should have as a tag team either. Um, but, you know, I don't want to get into, oh, WWE did, did these guys wrong. I mean, it's it's working out great for AJ. So <laughs> it just didn't work out great for them as a collective. Yeah, and and Anderson and Gallers don't really have any, any heat to throw at WWE. They've not really said anything too terrible or too negative. Uh. They're... They're just like, well, well, you know, it, 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 we did what we did. We made a lot of, but then they, they'll flat out tell you, they made a ton of money working for Vince and, you know, uh, how much, how much do you want to read into it though? Because I don't think they have a problem with WWE, but I absolutely think there are certain people working there that they do have a problem with. I agree with that for sure. I don't think they have a problem with the company as a whole, but no, I, I'm with you. I think there's certain elements there, uh, have they taken the high road for the most part? Have they mentioned anybody by name that you know of? Well, of course, the Paul Heyman thing, they were all mad at Heyman. Remember, AJ was mad at Heyman because um, supposedly AJ, Heyman threw uh, the Good Brothers under the bus, and they're the re- he's the reason they got fired. Mm. But, you know, that's depending on who you want to believe because AJ claims he came to Heyman and he told him that, no, they're safe. They're not going to get fired. But then you know, he went behind his back and told them that they were expendable because their contract was too big. Um, And, you know, the Good Brothers kind of said the same thing. They kind of say that he lied to them. So you don't know what the truth is there, but they don't seem to like Heyman. They also don't seem to like Triple H very much. Um, Shock. um, Just some of the stuff I've seen them tweet out about not being able to do Bullet Club stuff there. Like, it's clearly pointed at him. Um, he, they said, oh, man, the stuff they said when, because, you know, the plan originally, when AEW first started, they spoke to, um, they spoke to Kenny first, I think. And Kenny was very much trying to get them to AEW. This was, like, 2019, um, tw- January 2019. Um and then they spoke to the Bucks, and it seemed like that was that's what they were going to do. And then, you know, of course, WWE does what they they do when they know, they know someone's going to leave. They might not have a plan for you, but we want you to stay here because you can't go there. I'm not going right. to let you be go there and be great. So, you know, can you know this is Triple H texting them all the time, calling them all the time because he knew at that point that they were talking to the elite. So he told them, well, you know, you got to think about your family. You know, is this going to work out in a year? Is AEW still going to be around in a year? We can offer you security. And then you do that and fire them during the pandemic. Like, that was really, <laughs> that was a real shitty thing to do. Yes, it was. Yeah. So, I, yeah, so I think they are, they might have some hard feelings towards trips because of that. And maybe a few other people. But, yeah, I don't know. It is a crappy thing to do. Like you said, there's no doubt about it. And we've said that for a long time about, about the way they handled everything. AEW didn't let anybody go during the pandemic. New Japan, uh, the powers that be in New Japan, the higher ups, the guys wearing the shirt and ties who've never set foot in a wrestling ring took pay cut, pay cuts, man. Yeah. And, and you know, so they didn't have to let anybody go. And I'm like, 
it's a shame the billion dollar company can't do that, but okay. And um, they made record numbers. They their profits yes. were up. Their profits yes. were up, and they still let people go. And to let those two guys, like if anybody, they got let go at the time. I didn't think it would be the Good Brothers. They were just on WrestleMania, <laughs> like yeah, yes, and it's just in WrestleMania in like the biggest match of the weekend in the Boneyard match. So I was like, wow, to just let them go and then to make promises to them like that, and let them go, it's just, it's just messed up. Um, but the timing of it is so interesting because, um, almost to the date they got let go. I mean, well, not when they got little, almost to the date when they were talking about going to AEW. When this thing was first in conversation, January 2019, two years later, they show up on Dynamite. And I think that's five years after the elite jumped AJ. Just the way those times, the <laughs> timing synced up with that is crazy. Right. It's funny how things work, how things come full circle yeah. uh, in this business. It's crazy. Well, all of that leads me to this. As I said, yes, we've seen different variations of Bullet Club and we've seen them exist in other forms and we've seen the throwbacks to the original, the NWO, the Wolfpack, DX even, um, and the Click, obviously. So how do we feel about Kenny and what we thought were the Bucks, but now it turns out it's just Kenny and the Good Brothers, as of this recording, running together and Bad Luck Fale on Twitter had the pick of them together and said, Elite 2.0. <laughs> but, you know, Bullet Club is a new Japan and always will be. And I'm like, that's good stuff right there. So what do you make of all this, man? I think it's smart on their, I think it's smart on their side because if you are an AEW fan, chances are, you became an AEW fan based off of the strength of All In. And All In is very much a Bullet Club thing because, again, All In was this huge independent show off the backs of the popularity of the Bullet Club at that time. Um, so I think it's smart to try and do some kind of call back to, to Bullet Club with AEW because they hadn't done it so far. And I have to imagine it would have happened by now if Gallows and Anderson had came in 2019. Um, so I think it's smart, and I think it's smart to do it with Kenny as champion, especially because he's doing this thing now with Impact where you're invading another company, and that's tailor-made for Bullet Club to invade another company. Um, is it a long-term thing? I don't think it is. I think it's a now thing to kind of uh, wet people's beaks and go, oh, man, they're doing Bullet Club stuff. Is there a chance that, that Fale or somebody from New Japan will show up on dynamite, and I think that's all what it's all about is to try and position it to get heat around this. If in case we can get this deal to go through and we can make this crossover happen with New Japan, which still seems like it's such a long shot, but I mean, I never imagined that we would be going into this weekend and Kenny Omega would be main eventing an impact show, so you just never know what that could happen. <laughs> it's just it's crazy. Um, yeah, as far as what they did this week. It would have been very easy for them to come out and do the power move and have all five of them come out and, you know, beat down somebody like Bullet Club of old. But this is just how well they book their shows. And, you know, I don't want to come over like a huge AEW mark, but, you know, I thought it was very smart when they first started it. And Callis was um, talking to him backstage and he was like, yeah. And Kenny Omega's best friend, the Bucks, and he made it clear like I'm not your friend. He, yeah, that's your friend. That's not my. They're not my friends. And it made it clear before they even came out. Like he's trying to separate them. You could see the, you could see the battle lines getting drawn a little bit. So then when he came out and then he swerved them, I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And so to do it with um, the Good Brothers who are not going to be around long term, and then eventually it's just going to be Callis and Omega with this riff with, with the Bucks, I think it's smart. Yeah, it was, it was a nice swerve. Callis is, um, uh, you know, he, he's good for the swerve. He, he's got that rep and he's got that face that you just want to punch him. And, um, I mean, it's all good. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. It's a short term. I, I'm not getting too wrapped up in it. Uh, I do 
actually think that both companies are going to do business together. I think that cooler heads will prevail. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you still got the Moxley and Kenta thing that's going to happen in some form or fashion. It has to, at some point. I, yeah, I, there's been too much dialogue between, between both companies to think that it's going to be a closed door forever. I mean, the, the Tanahashi and Jericho match that happened, um, at Wrestle Kingdom last year, um, uh, had already presented the idea of it, and you can already tell that everybody's so receptive, receptive about it on both sides of the fan base. Um, so it just seems like a matter of time. And I mean, boy, with Kota with the championship, the idea of Kenny showing up to challenge him is just so it's it it's just it's fever pitch right now. This seems like the perfect time to try and do it. Um, so I don't I don't think it'll be long before they try and figure something out. It might not be a long term crossover thing. It might not be a partnership, but I feel like there's gonna be some kind of crossover at some point. It has to be. Yeah, I agree with you. There's I th- I think there's too much for both companies to gain for them to not do business. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you get New Japan would get more of a foothold in America, which they've been trying to do for years. Um. And I mean, you you just give the AEW crowd that is mostly a lot of them are New Japan crowd fans anyway. So you just give them more of a treat than what they want anyway. So yeah, I I don't see any reason not to work together. Um, and I mean, as far as like their storyline now, like I've been thinking since Good Brothers showed up last week, like okay, the match has to be Good Brothers versus Young Bucks. That has to be where this ends up, right? Like some big champion versus championship match. I agree. Uh, yeah, it's it's got to happen at some point. I mean, hundred percent. I don't know how it can't. Um, uh, and it just makes sense to do that. They are leading in that direction, and I, I mean, I do. We could we could be leading to a company versus company. Now, of course, I do. A lot of this is going to depend on travel restrictions, uh, quarantining, that kind of thing. Uh, and I don't think it matters when we actually release this particular episode because we're probably going to be going through this for another year. Mm-hmm. From all signs, point to another year of this. So, uh, yeah, dude, it's like I said. I, I think that that the upside to uh, to doing business is too great, and I think that the time will come when it's going to happen. Um. We can't really take this home without talking about two guys that we haven't really mentioned too much. Uh, Gato and Giotto. Um, Gato, as we know, is the booker of New Japan. One of, I'll say it, probably the smartest booker in the business. Um, His timing is impeccable. He's got instincts. He knows how to handle that roster full of talent. Um, I don't know if I've ever written anything about that company where I said, I feel so-and-so is misused. I don't feel they're being used to their fullest potential. I've written it a whole lot about the other companies here in the States, but I don't know if I've ever written about anybody in New Japan in a, in a derogatory statement, like, man, I wish this guy was getting used more. Gato just seems to know what he's doing. Um, how do you feel about the brothers working together and being out there with the Bullet Club as much as they are? Jado. <laughs> Jado's funny because you could tell Jado is, you know, he's reaching the end of his career. Like he's not moving really well, but he will still come out there with the Kindle stick, and he still comes out there with like the the face mask, and like, he'll hit somebody and do something heelish. Like he serves his purpose. Gato is a totally different beast, man. Gato, when he was with Okada and he was doing the doing the mouthpiece for Okada stuff. It was just so easy to hate him because he would just come out and he would just like I couldn't always tell everything that he was saying, but he just <laughs> he just emoted so well and he just had this way of cutting promos that was great. So once you pair him with another guy like Jay White and put him in Bullet Club, it works just as well. And he's even more hateable because you turned on Okada. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, and I've said this before. That at this point in Okada's career, he's become the Dusty Rhodes or the John Cena of New Japan. If if you want to get someone over as a heel, you turn them on Okada. Uh, it, it, you've only got really two guys. It's Okada or Tanahashi. 
And if you really want to get them over as a mega heel, you turn them on, on Okada. That's that's the jumping off point right there. Did it with Osprey, did it with Jay White. Um, I'm sure someone else that I'm not thinking of at the moment. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it makes perfect sense. Um, Ghetto and, and, and Okada together were a great pairing. I, I actually liked it a lot, Yeah. but, but Ghetto out there screaming, breathe with the switchblade is one of the coolest things ever. And I don't know, there's something about when he gets in the ring and points to the turnbuckle and Jay goes and stands on it to get that heel pop, you know, and I'm always thinking, I like this. There's something about it I really enjoy. And just the idea of Ghetto as being this this sniveling little weasel of a guy who who took the low road and just wanted the paycheck. And Kevin Kelly, who doesn't get enough credit for his work on commentary, who yeah. was really putting over the fact of, oh, Ghetto follows the dollar signs. That's what he cares about. He doesn't care about Jay White. He never cared about Okada. He just wants a paycheck. And I'm like, oh, that's good stuff right there, man. So Giotto, to me, he just looks uncomfortable. He looks like he can barely walk most of the time. And I'm thinking, why is this guy still working matches? I mean, all due respect to the Japanese guys, but someone needs to tell him, dude, you need to stop. Something's going to happen to you, man. Like, yikes. I don't know. Um, I mean, not everyone can can have a physique like Kojima and still can go and still barely break a sweat. And, and Kojima's however old he is. Yeah. That's not Giotto anymore. So <laughs> yeah. I kind of worry for the guy, man. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, you got to think Giotto is going to hang it up eventually. But, man, Ghetto, it just goes back to what you know about, you know, when you make that comparison to NWO and Bullet Club again. Because you know that Ghetto's a booker. If, like, if you're in the know, you know he's a booker. So you just immediately think, oh, no, Bullet Club has, like, the politics on their side now. And it's always that tease of that, but they never actually do it. Like they never right. actually get overboard with overbooking um, Bullet Club as the top guys. It was kind of like that with Okada when he was next to Okada. It was like, no, you know, he's next to the Booker and he's coming out and he's doing the elongated Rin Mika, and he's it's, it's <laughs> always so, it's always so ridiculous, but it worked. <laughs> oh my God, you're so right, and um. Yeah, how do we feel about um, th- this concept of, you know, Ghetto being the the unspoken but but acknowledged Eric Bischoff of the Bullet Club? I don't know that I. I, I, that way. I don't know that I ever it. thought about it in those terms, but that really is what's happening, you know. <laughs> what well, totally is what he is. Like he, that's exactly what he is. Just imagine him coming out, pointing, going, I love you. I love you guys so much. You guys are the best. Oh, man. I don't know, dude. That's, uh, uh, it's messed up. Yeah, they, they, the formulas are there. The equations are there. All the math is there. It's just that they're, they're moving the decimal in a different place. Like it is NWO and at any given time, if you squint and look at, and look in the right way, tilt your head a certain direction, you're like, Oh God, this is just, they're just ripping off the NWO. They're just ripping off Too Sweet and DX and ugh. And honestly, to me, it felt like that. But I think now, can we agree that maybe now Bullet Club has transcended their roots? You think they've risen above their origin story? I think they transcended them years ago, though. I think they, I think at first you could do that with like the first iteration. You could keep making those like illusions and even somewhat during AJ's run. But I think they've, they have so much staying power at this point and they've done so many different things and they're so influential in their own right. Um, that I think they've transcended that. Um, I mean, just when you look at the amount of great tag teams that have come through this thing, I mean, the young bucks, um, uh, Anderson and Gallo, GOD, like those are three of the best tag teams in wrestling right now. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you alluded to it earlier, uh, the, the fact that they've made stars. And I mean, to me, the, the the big quantifier with this thing is, you know, how many stars have they made? Has this gimmick just been to get the top guys over? Uh, you know, hint, hint, NWO. Or has it been to create stars, to build guys up? 
I mean, yeah. when you come, when you come out of Bullet Club, your stock is at an all time high, right? Yeah, and I mean, I can sit here and say that I don't, I didn't enjoy Cody as a part of Bullet Club, but it's undeniable that Bullet Club helped to rejuvenate him and make him a, a, the big star that he is right now. I mean, yeah, the same thing with Hangman. Hangman wouldn't have the name recognition he has right now if he wasn't in Bullet Club. Um, I mean, you can even look at guys that are not. Finn and AJ, they're WWE guys. They're Adam Cole. Um, mm. it just, it, I mean, the list goes on and on of guys that they have completely either helped them rise and become stars or they've com- com- completely reinvented their careers. No doubt about it, man. Uh, it's, it's, it's a breeding ground for talent in that faction. And the, the Bucks are on the record as saying, hey, we're, we're under no illusion of – how we got to where we are today, it's Bullet Club. They're the ones that put us there. And, uh, I mean, I totally agree with that. I think the Hangman Page comment is pitch perfect because it's it's absolutely true. I mean, yes, he's talented. Yes, he's got it coming because he's worked really hard over the years. But, man, if not for that hookup, if not for that, you know, that uh, that that black shirt, man, with the white skull on it, I mean, who knows where he'd be right now. So, uh, it seems to be, like you said, staying the test of time. Uh, I mean, it's the thing is, uh, is, uh, getting over, been over for a long time. I mean, they're year eight as we're heading into 2021 here. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. And, uh, I do think they're going to be around for a long time for sure. So sum it up for me, man. Give me your last word on the bullet club. I will have to say the hottest heel stable of the last decade. I don't think you could make an argument against that. I agree totally. I don't think you can have a conversation uh, when one day we all sit back and start writing the story of this generation. Bullet Club has to be mentioned in the top 10, top five, top three, perhaps, of the biggest things to come out of this generation is a Bullet Club for sure. And they took the bones of the NWO. They took the, the bones of DX, two factions that, you know, overstayed their welcome, in my opinion, all due respect to everyone involved. But there, there reaches a point of, okay, this doesn't sell like it used to. This no longer works the way it used to. The members are older. The ideas are outdated. The catchphrases are tired. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't see that with the Bullet Club. I feel like that they constantly reinvent, reinvent themselves. They do an excellent job of that. And as I said, I think this faction will be around, hopefully, for many years to come. And that is the bullet club hey thanks for listening to the show check out our social media on twitter facebook and instagram at 6m podcast we'll see you next time